So uh, welcome everyone. For those of you who are regular attendees of our seminars, this is actually a new seminar, which we are kicking off our monthly uh, seminars that are open to the entire uh, intramural program. And so uh, we have our inaugural uh, lecturer for that, which is Heidi Rehm. Heidi Rehm is not only a, a friend and a great colleague, she's a great critic. And uh, I have to say, I just always enjoy working with people who not that infrequently tell you you're just wrong about something, and you enjoy the interaction. And it's a great thing. Everyone should have colleagues like this. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, Heidi's co-director of the program in medical and population genetics and a member of the Broad Institute. She is, this is a great title, Chief Genomics Officer in the Department of Medicine at Mass General Hospital and a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and a faculty member for the Center of Genomic Medicine at Mass General. So Heidi, please take it away. Oh, I forgot the logistics, sorry. Chat has been, for those of you who are online, chat has been disabled, I'm supposed to say. And if you have questions, please input them in written form, uh, for those of you who are online, written questions in the Q&A box, and I'll be watching those. And Heidi, do you prefer questions uh, ongoing or at the end? Uh, ongoing is good. Okay, uh, so if you have a question at, at, the, at any juncture, uh, please put it through and we will consider it and Q&A at the end, and if you're in person, Q&A at the microphone at the end. So welcome, Heidi. It's great to be here and uh, share with you a little bit, just stand off to the side, you know, when you're short, you like to stand not behind a, a podium. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit about what I work on, and it spans, let's see if I can just advance, there we go. Um, it spans a few different areas, so I'm gonna first talk a little bit about our rare disease research and the programs we're gonna do, but that will sort of lead into just generally as a field thinking about solving some of the challenges in rare disease diagnosis and discovery. And along the way, I'll talk about a lot of the resources that we build because my goal is not just to do the work myself, but try to build tools and resources that the entire community can use. So we'll talk a little bit about those things as we go along. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll put on my chief genomics officer hat and talk a little bit about my role in the hospital setting and some of the work that we're doing to try to actually get this work to patients. Um, with that, I'll start out with the rare disease side. So I think it's worth just thinking about where we are today in rare disease discovery. There have been uh, over 4,800 genes implicated in at least one disease. Um, but depending on whose cohort you're looking at, 50 to 75% of cases remain unsolved after we you know, perform exome or genome sequencing. And there's some evidence for at least 5,000, perhaps as many as 10,000 more genes to yet to be discovered for monogenic disease. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so we, are, we put together a center, Daniel MacArthur and I started our center uh, for Mendelian Genomics uh, a number of years ago. It's now led by Anna Donaluria, Mike Talkowski, and myself. Uh, and we have a large team that works on everything from recruitment to methods development to analysis um, and uh, development of the tools that we use to do all our work. We appreciate the funding, including from NHGRI and other NIH sources. Um, and this team is really how we get our work done in rare disease analysis. But equally important is the fact that we partner with lots of colleagues, and these are many of the um, physicians and researchers that we partner with, each of whom is recruiting their own cases in their respective disease areas. We also partner with patients, uh, patient organizations there on the right, uh, and have our own direct recruitment into our what we call the Rare Genomes Project. And that has led to over 20,000 samples from over 8,000 families, from over 50 collaborators from 57 countries. So it brings us just a lot of rich data to work with. Uh, and those partnerships have been incredibly valuable. Now, one thing we did discover, because our, our recruitment for our Rare Genomes Project um, is online, it can, anyone can be virtually consented and sign up, but we definitely realized that we were not pulling from as many underrepresented populations. So over the last year, we've been really trying hard 
to come up with strategies to have better representation and try to understand the barriers to, to uh, enrollment. So we've done a number of things. Instead of just asking our clinicians to tell the patient about the study, we actually have them fill out a form, send it to us, and then we do outreach. Because sometimes these families are just too busy to put this at the top of their list to go contact some study. And that has improved our enrollment of underrepresented individuals. We've also um, hired uh, lots of multilingual staff. We now have staff that work nights and weekends so that we can adhere to the timelines and when these families are available. We've actually now contracted with Quest for mobile um, blood draws so they will go to the individual's house at there on weekends or evenings to get blood draws. These are all many different barriers. And so it's actually starting to improve our enrollment of underrepresented individuals in rare disease diagnosis. Um, another way that we really democratize the work we do and crowdsource it in a lot of ways is the Seeker genomic analysis platform that we have built. We've made it open source. Um, this was originally started by Daniel MacArthur. We now have it uh, installed on the Anvil platform. So the main instance that we use is the same one that anyone can come onto the Anvil platform and use. Um, and that allows all sorts of different types of analyses that you can do. We bring in RNA-seq data. Um, there's now over 2,000 people from over 100 countries that have performed analysis with this platform. And we constantly add new features and data types to that platform. And that way, everything that we bring in new, everybody else can get access to as well. Um, and so I mentioned that's on Anvil. Not only is that platform on Anvil, but all of our data is also shared on Anvil, um, both through a duo space system as well as now part of the Gregor consortium data set. And just as an example of the benefits of data sharing, so um, th this was one of our cases that we hadn't yet solved, but Aaron Quinlan, who is a bioinformatics computational scientist, was testing out his new structural variant collar on our data and solved one of our cases. So you know, just examples of the importance of putting all your tools and data out there because collectively we can make more discoveries together. Uh, so definitely encourage that use of platforms like Anvil, which is NHGRI's cloud-based platform, for both um, sharing your tools and pipelines as well as your data. So what progress have we made in, in our own studies? So this is our solve rates for both um, exome data and, and genome. And I've parsed this, or I should say a member of my team has parsed this, by solved or a candidate gene. So still, you know, at the time we discovered it, it was still in um, that candidate state needing more evidence or unsolved. Um, and this has now led to a lot of these um, candidates being fully fledged novel gene discoveries that have been published, working with many of our collaborators as well. So I'm going to, you know, sort of parse this side of this table into about 35% positive we get, 45% negative, and 20% inconclusive. But now the question is, okay, what do we do next? How do we follow up these cases? Well, obviously the solves are done. But for the unsolved, so some of these might be variants that are missing from the actual sequencing data. Um, so you know, uh, one obvious step when we start out with exome is to you know, move to genome. Those are one way we can find additional um, variants that might have been missed in the first round when they're actual physical variants. So we did um, some analysis of, of what the added value of genome is. Um, and this chart just shows the additional discoveries that were made um, by our genome analysis after exome. But we clarify that in a lot of cases, people say, oh, I, you know, I added 30% yield. Well, in a lot of those cases, it's just that those variants would have been found by exome, but you did your exome a long time ago and you hadn't looked at it. So we differentiated those things that really still to this day with a current exome and current analysis would not have detected and then parse those into um, the ones that are requires genome sequencing. So those are mostly due to structural variants, coding variants where there's consistently poor coverage in exome, the deeper intronics, the triplet repeat expansions, those are the things that the, the genome actually adds. And when you get rid of things that should have been caught by a current exome, it really adds a yield in our hands of about 8.3%. So those are you know, really adding actual technical um, additional yield. 
Um, the other thing is, um, like many groups, we are using different types of long read sequencing to clarify regions that are difficult to get from short read. So we're um, in the process of analyzing a lot of long read data um, from both uh, ONT and PacBio. And I don't yet have that data summarized, but we have, this is just one example that's shown there um, of a region that was very difficult to sequence, but we were able to detect um, a 1 kV deletion that was de novo in that region. Um, the other tool that we've been using quite a bit of is RNA-seq. Um, and that, in that case, it's an example where the variant is present in your data, but you're overlooking it, because especially if it's a deep intronic, it's just really hard to figure out that that might be causal. Although I will say the Splice AI um, tool that's been developed based on machine learning is actually one of the much better tools in this arena. So if you haven't implemented Splice AI, I, I do recommend it um, as an, a tool that really has done a good job at finding cryptic splice sites and, um, and other types of splice variation. And then we follow that up with um, getting uh, tissue samples so that we can look at RNA-seq and see if we can show an actual change in splice splicing. Um, it really helps with non-coding interrogation. So this is a case of a patient with central nuclear myopathy with hypotonia, weakness, ptosis, reflux. And there was clinical suspicion for myotubular myopathy, but they were negative for MTM1, which is the known gene for that, uh, negative by exome sequencing. But in the end, we did trio gen genome sequencing with RNA-seq on muscle tissue. Um, we analyzed for all the types of variants, but ultimately, we were able to show with the RNA-seq very low expression of that exact suspected gene. Um, and then we're able to show the alteration in splicing um, with, within that gene. And it turns out that there was a retrotranspose online element inserted into intron 3. And it was actually also a mosaic in the mother. So you know, the we only reason we were able to really zero in on that is because of the RNA-seq data that could, could detect that. Um, this was an even more interesting case. So this was a, um, a one of our Rare Genomes Project cases. And what it was showing was a whole lot of genes, some of which were underexpressed, some of which were overexpressed. Um, and we looked at all of these genes that were under and over. We could not find anything obvious. But then we looked at the retained intron signal. And what you can see here is that this particular sample was off the charts compared to all of our other RNA-seq samples in terms of retained introns. But interestingly, when you went in, it, it wasn't just all introns. There were select introns that were retained where nearby introns were not. And it turns out that this particular gene, uh, it's actually an RNA uh, uh, non-coding gene or uh, RNA gene, RNA nu 4 tac that basically is part of that U12 dependent minor spliceosome. So there's, there's about 0.5% of introns in our genes that are spliced with this spliceosome um, uh, approach and that these introns were being retained. Um, and so because of that retention, in some cases it was showing overexpression because there was more RNA material. In other cases, we think the underexpression was the rapid degradation of the transcript leading to less. And so you're seeing sort of both of this stuff on both sides. Um, so that was an interesting case. And overall, if we look across 170 cases that we've done with RNA-seq, we've been able to solve an added 14% of cases by adding RNA-seq data to our analysis. So the challenge is that that works great for diseases that are like, that are muscle diseases where you can get access to tissue that is relevant to the disease and the gene is going to be expressed. It gets a little more challenging when you have disorders like eye disease and neurodevelopmental disorders where taking the blood biopsy and the eye biopsy are a little more challenging. Um, but sometimes those genes can be expressed in blood or in fibroblasts, so it's, not, it's sometimes worth trying even if you can't get access to a disease-relevant tissue. Um, but then moving on to the last bucket here, um, well, actually, just to, um, so this last one, let me go back for a second. So, in this last bucket, we might have detected a variant, but it was classified as a variant of uncertain significance. Um, so thinking about the exome reanalysis paradigm and how often we find discoveries when we, the first time we looked at it, we didn't see it. 
So our solve rate in reanalysis is about 17.7%. So that's really the highest yield of tools that we have is just going back later to the same data, um, amazingly enough. And so what we're now working on is really a more rapid automated reanalysis pipeline. And so we've been working to build that. So we call our pipeline that this has been developed in collaboration with both um, Dana MacArthur's team in Australia, our team at the Broad, and Microsoft um, team that we've been collaborating with. Um, and basically building a tool that brings in um, ClinVar data, GenCC, um, uh, also OMIM, you know, all the sort of knowledge sources bringing in some of the predictors like the Splice AI tool and other things and bringing all of this into um, an automated pipeline that then runs on our data. And we were validating it initially and being able to show that we were able to catch um, pretty high percentage of the variants that we'd already caught. Um, and then we've been now really looking at the specificity and time efficiency. We have compared it to other tools like Eximizer and Lyrical, where our recovery rate is higher than some of the existing tools that are out there now. So we're starting to now, and, and the rate, like we definitely don't want a tool that's gonna trigger every case every round, because <laughs> that just creates work. So what we found is that there's about one candidate uh, variant per 200 cases per month that are coming up. Um, and we've made five new solves over the past, past year. So it's actually um, a reasonable rate of, of things to review, and then you're just reviewing those cases that, that get flagged. Um, so this is sort of a, this is a pipeline that we're gonna then be putting into place now that we've um, been validating it. This is also something key to think about. So there's a ton of data that goes to clinical labs. A clinician orders a test, um, gets run at a clinical lab, and some of those labs will offer one free reanalysis after a year, but then the, after that, that's it. You know, and, um, and, and so what we're trying to work on right now is bringing all of the data from clinical labs into the Anvil platform and then allow those clinician researchers to be able to look at their cases in our seeker platform um, as well as have this run through this automated interpretation pipeline. So our first, um, this is actually um, a project that's partly funded through the Anvil clinical resource, an add-on to the Anvil grant. And so we're working with GeneDx as the first clinical lab where we'll set up a pipeline. So this means the clinician doesn't have to themselves go ask GeneDx for the data, get the data on a hard drive, go load it someplace, and, all, and, and what's being done now, we're gonna set up a pipeline where the clinician just tells the team what the, what the sample is, and then we'll manage the process of GeneDx to Anvil um, pipeline. And then also then the pipeline for uh, joint calling and loading that data into Seeker, oops, as well as then running this automated interpretation pipeline. It'll then, when new findings, it'll actually send an email to the clinician saying uh, a new finding is there if you want to look at it. So they can both look at it themselves immediately as, when the data gets in there, but then this pipeline will also be running. So this is infrastructure that's not yet in place yet, but we're working with GeneDx and then we'll once we get it working with GeneDx, we'll add other clinical ads. And we really hope that this is a way to reuse this clinical data um, and bring it into research uh, in the future, more, uh, at, more at scale, I should say. Okay, then going back down to the, the bottom section. So many of us find those dreaded VUSs, um, and they may be in novel genes, or they may be in known genes. So how do we really robustly tackle this challenge? Um, so I think it's also worth stepping back and just thinking about the overall challenge we have in rare disease. So most rare diseases are actually incredibly rare. And this figure that I've captured from the Orphanet group on the side here is basically showing you that 80% of the people walking around with rare disease, like some of you may hear people say, one in 10 individuals has rare disease. They're collectively quite common. And that is true. But the challenging thing is that 80% of those people with rare disease have it due to the most common 150 <laughs> rare diseases. And in fact, most of the rare diseases, 3,000 here, represent less than 1% of people with rare disease, and these are the much rarer than one in a million. So there is 
likelihood that any given physician or clinical lab or researcher will ever see more than one of case. So there is no ability to build evidence to implicate these, new, these diseases, these very rare diseases, um, and the genes that cause them, unless you collaborate and share data. And that was why we built this platform now uh, about eight years ago called the Matchmaker Exchange. And the idea was somebody has a candidate gene and you just wanna find that other case somewhere on the planet where they have the same candidate gene. Um, and so we, but finding that person was challenging. So we put it into a, a platform called the Matchmaker Exchange. We now have nine nodes uh, that are connected from around the world. Nobody's data moves, it all sits in their own databases, but we connect all these databases through a common API. Uh, and so that if you, when we put a variant in our, or a gene in our seeker database, it then queries all of these other databases and if there's a match, it returns that, it connects the groups together and then they can share detailed phenotypes and if it's a discovery, uh, you can co-publish it. So from our own experience, we've submitted over 1,500 unique genes into Matchmaker Exchange. We've received queries on a half million uh, queries from other databases that has triggered 13,000 matches to candidates and seeker. Overall, this has led to over 300 novel gene discoveries. Almost every discovery that we and our collaborators make has benefited from matches in Matchmaker Exchange. I would argue it's one of the most useful tools in rare disease research in terms of the data sharing element of it. Um, so that is current platform. But here's the challenge. For many of our cases, we don't have a candidate um, and there's nothing to put into matchmaker exchange, right? Um, so you know, what do we do with this? Um, or it's a VUS and a known gene. So there's no candidate here. You just one of the many dreaded VUSs we find in every gene we look at. So we're working on our next step of this game. So right now we like to call a matchmaker exchange two-sided matching. Both groups have a candidate. Um, and now what we wanna do is one group has a candidate and they just wanna query all of the raw data around the world. <laughs> so seems, seems easy, no it's not. Eventually we'll wanna do zero-sided matching. Nobody has any hypothesis and just bring all the data together and we'll solve everything. So that's eventually where we're headed. But, but sharing gl data globally across countries is actually no small feat. So we are trying to ease into this with what we call one-sided matching. And so we've been starting to, there are groups that have been opening their databases to allow query of the raw data. And the first one that I'm aware of is Variant Matcher. It's the same group that built uh, the, the Gene Matcher platform that's part of our Matchmaker Exchange Network at Hopkins, led by Nara Sobrera. And so here I can just sign up, as I have for a username uh, to their database, log in. Here I entered my variant with the phenotypes in my case and immediately got back a list of eight individuals who have that variant along with their phenotypes, which I've highlighted in red. And you'll quickly see that half of the individuals are unaffected parents. The other half have four different phenotypes that don't overlap with mine and largely quickly ruled out this variant as causal. Ruling out a variant as causal is equally useful as you know, building the evidence. So this was just an example of ruling it out. So we're now working to build a federated variant level matching platform around the world. We're working with Global Alliance on this, same as we did for the Matchmaker Exchange. We have an API that's called the Beacon Version 2 API that will be used to connect all these databases. These are many of the groups that we are currently working with to hook up. The first um, node to node connection has gone live between Variant Matcher and Franklin, which is actually a commercial platform used by many clinical labs. And I'll just show you. So now if you, if you are in Variant Matcher using that platform, um, de by default down here, you will also be querying the Franklin database, um, that commercial platform. Similarly, if we go over to Franklin, when you're in that database that lots of clinical labs use, um, you will automatically see whether the variant is in Variant Matcher. In this case, it wasn't. Or in this other variant, the variant was found 726 times, 144 homozygotes. And when it's found, you can click on the link and it, direct, and it drops you right into variant matcher where you can see the phenotypes. So this makes it far easier than if I were to have to go around and one by one log into a thousand different databases to query for my variant. So this is a way that we're really starting to develop this platform. This is the first node to node connection. Um, but we're working on uh, connecting our seeker platform to this node um, and or to the 
feder federated platform and we'll be bringing lots of groups uh, into this whole system. So this is just one step in that sort of global data sharing approach um, that will get us to really understanding the variants and solving these cases. Um, another approach in the data sharing realm is really getting access to large scale genomic data very easily without having to log into any database. Um, you can just see it publicly. So we just launched this fall the next version of Nomad where we're now up to 807,000 exomes and genomes. You can see from our past sizes of a database, this was a pretty significant jump um, in, in added data. Now, interestingly, a lot of the data we added was from the UK Biobank. Almost a half million samples came from the UK Biobank, which unfortunately, from a diversity standpoint, is a lot of European data, <laughs> the big blue bar there. So however, despite the fact that we added a lot of European data, we did add 169,000 non-European samples to that, particularly increase in Middle Eastern data. So pretty much all of the underrepresented populations, we were able to add um, a lot more diversity. Now, interestingly, what NOMAD is best at is ruling out variants because they're too high allele frequency to be implicated in rare disease. That is mostly what all of us use it for. We also use it for gene constraint to find genes that are likely to be implicated in, in mon monogenic disease, but mostly it's to exclude variants. So a key question is, well, how many variants did you now convert to being too common to cause rare disease when we added this data, right? So on the left side here, or the, that little animation was uh, me, whoops, let me try it again was going from V2 to V4. And you saw all those European samples. If you were looking at the right side, this is the number of variants with an allele frequency over 0.1%, which largely rules them out for monogenic disease. But if you looked carefully at that, what you saw is that despite adding like another half million European samples, the size of this bar barely moved. However, it moved hugely on the non-represented populations. And that tells you that we've mostly saturated our understanding of common variation in Europeans. We have not even closely tapped our understanding of common variation in other populations in terms of access to that data. So it is immensely critical that we focus on the collection of diverse data sets for monogenic disease uh, analysis. And um, our next launches, V5 and V6, I'm not sure which order they'll be in, um, but V5 will focus on um, adding the next call set from the All of Us program, 450,000, which is over half from underrepresented populations. And V6, we're working on a federated nomad. So to date, we've only been able to do nomad by bringing all the data physically together and processing it, QCing it as a joint call data set. Um, we are now working on with collaborators in all of these countries here um, where there are groups that are willing to process their data with the approaches we use in NOMAD and get a final aggregate allele frequency data set that then they can send outside their country, whereas they can't send the raw data to us right now. Then we could aggregate the aggregate data sets and actually launch a essentially a, a, a federated representation of NOMAD, but it's all still in one database at the aggregate level. And so it's gonna be a little bit of a heavy lift in terms of the computational approaches we need each of these groups to do, but that is our commitment to really working on ways to bring in much, much more diverse data sets into NOMAD. Um, so down in this bottom bucket, you know, there are different ways we're dealing with these VUSs, matchmaker exchange, the variant level matching, NOMAD. Of course, you know, we do partner with COMP and other groups that can run functional studies on our variants to help interpret them. But the other challenge is with a constant evolution of evidence for the role of genes and variants in disease, how do we keep track and ensure the resources that we're all using are accurate and up to date for widespread use? Um, so we've been working on generating knowledge bases. Uh, some of that comes through ClinGen. The newest uh, knowledge base we've launched is called GenCC for the Gene Curation Coalition. And this started a few years ago when we recognized that there were a number of public resources like ClinGen, OMIM, um, the Genomics England panel app and the Australian panel app and Orphanet that all had gene level resources, but they were all using different systems to define 
the relationships, the validity of those relationships. So we were trying to get everybody to harmonize these resources. We then discovered that there are actually a lot of private groups, particularly clinical labs, they were curating gene disease relationships with ClinGen standards, but none of that data was public. So we worked to get all of this data together for gene disease relationships. I like to call it the ClinVar for genes, because anybody can submit their own opinion of a gene disease relationship, just like you submit your own classification of pathogenicity for a variant. So essentially, it's a ClinVar for genes. Um, so, so once all that data is now harmonized and publicly available, and we can compare it, we then are collaborating to resolve di discrepancies in which genes are actually validly implicated in disease. So this is just a screenshot from the database. We have 12 different groups submitting uh, with over 17,000 gene disease relationship claims. So you can type in your favorite gene um, and uh, you'll see, oh, ClinGen says it's strong for this disease or disputed for that disease, Genomics England says this, and so on. And then you can dive deeper and get more information. There's a, a quick overall look at what, what the claims are on any given gene on the, on the sheet. So we've been now uh, taking this pipeline and feeding it into our own genomic analysis pipelines. Um, OMIM is often behind in novel gene discoveries. So um, there's groups like Australia that are curating the literature and putting things in. We're now getting the Gregor Consortium to put our novel gene discoveries that aren't even published into this as a way to earlier in the process get out these, um, these gene disease relationships. And also clarify whether they're valid um, by doing the discrepancy resolution. So we've done 33 discrepancies so far across the groups. Um, we mostly define whether they're have at least moderate or above versus limited and below. And that is a boundary of what you should put in a clinical test versus not. And so we try to, to vote and get them either above or below by consensus. Occasionally we hit borderline and just can't agree where it sits. Yes, question. gene lists and diagnoses for rare disease, either genome or EHR analyses. And he's, then the sub-comment is, I imagine international data silos might be limiting here also. Yes, there's a few questions in there. So um, in terms of AI and machine learning, so there's different ways it's being used. I, I mentioned um, Splice AI is actually a really good tool. That was developed by machine learning by basically looking at the entire human genome and asking what are the sequences that have led to exonic splice junctions in real life. And that actual ML that was used is why that algorithm works so well. So there's very, very precise and good examples of the use of machine learning in the context of genomic analysis. I think another area, so we're, we have a collaboration with Microsoft right now working on actually aggregating evidence from the global, you know, internet, literature, et cetera, to really just make it quicker for the analyst to, to review all of the evidence about a gene or a variant. And so we're, we're creating, it's, it's just the time it takes to go out and search PubMed and Google Scholar and all the different resources and databases, that, that, that takes time. And so some of it is just, can we bring that information much more quickly to the analyst to then make a decision. Um, I think one of the challenges today is that most of the evidence that is the most valuable evidence we use in classifying variants is not accessible to computational infrastructure. It's like pedigrees or de novo occurrence or <laughs> functional data that's not well structured, things like that. So we as a community, if we're gonna make use of AI and machine learning, we ne really need to get our data structured and accessible to these tools. Then I think they will work better. I will say that um, the, the consumption of electronic health record data and the phenotypes, I think, is going to be um, a useful area for AI and machine learning. It's already proven useful. I was just talking to Chris Lent the other day, and Jeff, since Jeff Ginsburg asked this question as the CSO of the, of the All of This program, you know, Chris has been, you know, looking at how well the data, instead of relying on ICD-9 codes and other things in the EHR, to actually just take the entire EHR content for an individual and use that in your phenotypic extraction and improving much better. 
That said, you still only have what goes into the EHR, which is a limited set of, of, of things that your patient has. So, and, and rare disease is not the greatest, EHR is not the greatest for rare disease, uh, where we really want to use terms like the human phenotype ontology, which is still not well represented in the EHR. So I think there's lots of exciting areas for AI, and I think it's going to rapidly take off. Um, but exactly, you know, how well it's going to do, I think, just remains to be seen. But, but lots of people, including ourselves, are starting to work with these tools. Did I hit uh, enough of that? Great. Um, so ClinVar is also a really critical research um, resource. And of course, we get more and more submitters around the world um, submitting to ClinVar. It um, it's really helps crowdsource the problem. Um, but, you know, we still have the highest category in ClinVar is variants of uncertain significance, right? Um, and these are just, as the panels expand, the rate of VUSs on these clinical tests going back to patients is just continued to expand. And then reclassification, our MGH Cancer Center received vari variant knowledge updates on 17% of the variants in our patients. It's, and the clinicians are getting annoyed <laughs> in some ways about the constant updates and reclassifications. We also heard from several insurance companies concern, and one of the reasons they're not reimbursing exome and genome is the fear of all the VUSs returned to patients from these exomes and genomes. So we actually said, you know what? Or I, I didn't think that was accurate, that the genomes and exomes were generating all the VUSs. So we, we actually collected data from 19 labs across the US and Canada, um, uh, 1.5 million tests worth of data. It gives you a sense of what's being run today. So about 97% of tests run in this period were uh, panel tests, and about 3% um, were uh, exome or genome. But um, uh, what we found is that the rate of VUSs was statistically significantly higher in panels compared to exomes and genomes, which seems a little counterintuitive, and it's very correlated. So the size of the panel as it goes up um, it gets higher, no surprise, but then it goes down for exomes and genomes. Why is that? Um, well, it's actually quite obvious if you understand how clinical labs work. What do they do? They get no phenotype for the panel tests. They're asked to interpret all the variants, and they report out everything that's VUS and above with no correlation to the phenotype of the patient. And as the panels get bigger, the correlation between phenotype and the gene is actually pretty low. In an exome and genome, you cannot write a report and interpret it without phenotype. So then what do you do? You look at all the variants and see how well they correlate with the phenotype, and you only put the ones most suspicious onto your report. That is why the rate of VUSs is lower, is because we're actually using our brains to interpret that and not just this sort of pipeline process. But either way you look at it, a third of all genetic tests end in an inclusive result due to VUS. So that's a problem no matter whether you're running exomes or genomes. I will say we, some of the labs that um, were part of this study with the lab I used to run at Mass General Brigham and Quest, we're using subclasses of VUS. Um, and what you see here is only those VUS low get reported in, in the panel tests. They, nobody ever puts those on the exome and genome, right? So this is just an indication of why it's better to really think about the level of evidence and what you put on reports. Um, and in the new framework that Les and Stephen and our group is leading, we will very explicitly define three buckets of VUS, VUS low, VUS high, and VUS um, mid. So, and we've actually been looking across the three labs uh, and just discovered LabCorp has been doing this for 15 years too, so we're bringing their data in. And we asked the question, how often does a VUS low get reclassified to path or likely path? And the answer is, it never has across these three labs. Uh, there was one variant in here in this figure, which we just took out because it turned out it was a risk allele. It wasn't actually a pathogenic. Um, so essentially, we can use this data to justify that these variants in the VUS low category probably shouldn't be put on the front of a report and could maybe just get relegated to a supplement or something. So we actually, um, I formed a work group through American College of Medical Genetics, and we're now developing guidelines for labs on when to report VUSs, and most importantly, when not to report VUSs and how to use these new subclasses that will be coming out with the new guidelines. Um, with that, I, how much time do we have? Okay, um, so I did wanna talk a little bit about the Global Alliance. 
Um, I mentioned this earlier because we're working with the Global Alliance in developing the standards for this variant level matching platform. But this, um, I recently became chair of the Global Alliance and I spend a lot of my time with this organization because in my mind it's critical for the next era of genomics where we really need to share data and work collaboratively across the entire globe, but that's not gonna work well if we don't all use the same standards for how we structure our data, share our data, et cetera. So we have you know, a whole organization of partners and driver projects and assigned experts and contributors. Um, we have these work streams, developing standards in these different areas and kind of a whole ecosystem of defining the needs of our community, creating those standards and implementing them. And so if you haven't gotten involved, I encourage you to do so. One of the areas that I'm, I spend a bit of my time is, is our national initiatives forum, where really a lot of these countries are implementing genomic medicine at scale in their countries. And these are all the members of the um, national initiatives. That includes the All of Us research program. And we've been developing sort of a toolkit for um, countries in terms of addressing a lot of the different aspects of genomics from government strategy, engagement of patient populations, clinical tools, knowledge curation, technical and data tools, consent and result return, uh, where all the stars are, are, are standards that have been developed by the Global Alliance to help in these different areas. And then we all convene, uh, both virtually in conference calls, as well as physically in two in-person meetings a year, to share our experiences and best practices and really try to harmonize all the approaches that we take in this space. Similarly, we work across the world in ClinGen, and we have now over 2,800 volunteers across 66 countries that participate in over 100 expert panels that are classifying genes and variants. And it's a wonderful way to really expert curate this knowledge um, in, in these different disease areas, bringing the experts into these different expert panels. Um, and so it's a critical way. It's also a way we get access to evidence because the people with the best evidence join these panels and then we get their evidence when it's not always uh, anywhere publicly accessible. Um, as I mentioned, all of us is part of um, the national initiatives, um, but I also think it's an incredibly important resource for, um, for, for generating knowledge because we can get access to patient phenotypes at a large scale. We are also working to return results um, as a way of returning value to participants. And so we've been returning um, both health-related genetic results uh, and pharmacogenomic results to uh, individuals. Uh, this is a little bit out of date, but we've returned over 100,000 uh, results from the hereditary disease risk panels. And the color team that supports genetic counseling appointments done over 2,000 genetic counseling appointments to return um, mostly positive uh, results to individuals. So a lot of uh, work there. The last little bit I'll talk about, as I mentioned, is our, our efforts within the hospital. So I have a small team. Um, at Mass General that's really trying to work to integrate genomics into medical practice. This is the team shown here, and we basically work to engage stakeholders, identify pain points, and deliver new solutions. So I don't have t time to talk about all the stuff, but one of the things I did was convene a genomic medicine implementation team. Um, uh, it, luckily, I did that across both hospitals because just a few weeks ago, it was announced that Mass General and Brigham would be fully merging in the ne next couple of years. Um, so lucky for me, there's only one chief genomics officer, and I work across both hospitals, so I think I'll keep this job. But um, nonetheless, we identify clinician leads and, genet and where there are genetic counselors, those leads across each clinical division across the hospital. And then they we then gather on a regular basis to understand where the pain points are across all these clinics and then try to deliver solutions. So we've done a lot of different things, standardizing consent forms, consolidating external genetic test services, integrating results into the EHR. We've developed a genetic counseling network and deployable part-time genetic counseling services. So we share counselors across different clinics that don't need a full-time effort. Um, we now have a referral website for all the codes for referring to the different genetics clinics across specialties. We've developed education programs, and I'll spend the last little bit on some of our preventive genomics efforts. Um, so uh, let me just advance the slide. So we recognize there was a major gap in our, our care provision in genetics in terms of at-risk patients. So the cancer center had a massive population of patients 
who met NCCN guidelines for cancer risk, and they couldn't handle the appointments. They can only manage to handle those with cancer or sometimes the family members through cascade testing. They couldn't handle the volume. So we launched the preventive genomics to handle that volume of cancer susceptibility, as well as preconception carrier screening. Our OB clinics couldn't handle the volume of carrier screening requests. Um, so that was the main incentive, and in fact, those were the, some of the largest volume of tests. But we had two clinicians seeing patients. There was only so many they could see, right? So we actually, uh, despite this being quite successful and getting the referrals and the focus that we wanted, and most of the patients weren't paying anything, they were you know, covered by insurance for these indications, we actually discontinued this because we couldn't actually scale it at a level to meet the patient demand. And so we've then switched and now launched preventive genetic counseling services in conjunction with primary care. So the idea here is RGCs um, work with primary care. Um, so they indicate they have a patient, and then we do pre-visit. The ge genetic counseling assistant collects the pre-visit information. We have a telehealth visit with the genetic counselor. The order is placed, but it's placed with the primary care physician's name as the orderer. And then we help with return results. If they're positive, then the, the PCP does the referral to the specialty clinic. This has allowed us to scale much more quickly. We're still hitting the target populations we're trying to hit is the cancer risk, preconception, screening. We deal with, despite the fact that none of us want to, the DTC results that the physicians don't know what to do with and the occasional other thing. But this has just started in the last like five months and it's really taking off. We're starting to go around to all the PCPs and they are really liking it. So that's a, a way and we hope that over time with them getting used to this, they actually may not need us to, to be there once they really get used to it. So, and we've also launched an e-consult service um, where we, any physician can put in a basic question and then our team returns a result uh, or, or our guidance through the e-consult. And that's been effective um, in terms of the outcome. So these are the different types of um, recommendations we made through the e-consult service. Most were from PCPs. That was our target population to, to a large extent. Of the 88 actionable recommendations, 78% were followed through by a provider. Um, only 17% were not followed, and 5% we couldn't track because they left the system. But we published these results in terms of our experience supporting e-consult. So this service is continued, and now our, our scalable GC service is there in place. And with that, I'm going to stop so we have more time for questions. Um, but I did want to thank a lot of people that work on a lot of the different projects that I've talked about today, as well as the funding support that we received to be able to do all this uh, fun work. And I'm happy to take any more questions. Thank you. Dr. Green. A tour de force, not surprising. Um, if, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear you say much about the growing availability of more and more diverse reference sequences, mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. a pan-genome. And I would think for especially some of, the, some of the topics you covered, mm -hmm. including rare disease work, that is it possible you're unsolved because you're missing variants because you just haven't used the, the, the right of the, the best mm -hmm. reference isn't either available or you haven't started using it yet? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we do have work underway, both within the Global Alliance, working with the ha Human Pan Genome Consortium, as well as um, working with EBI and NCBI on anna annotation of the ha human pan genome. Um, and we have a project within the Gregor Consortium where we're hoping to try to assess the added yield by using different gen pan genome sequences, as you are alluding to. Um, it's, it's a good question as to what we think will actually be the outcome of that. Um, I think um, both long read analysis as well as um, different genomes, because I think where the biggest challenge is is those regions that have significant chunks of difference between, um, between haplotypes, right? Where an entire region is either missing from the current right. genome build or, um, or there's duplications, other things. So right now, the, that's not gonna help much if we don't have access to long read technologies that can actually get at those most challenging regions. So we're both starting with long read that will allow us to look at those but we also need to define the allele frequencies 
of variants in those regions that have no data in Nomad because they're from short read data, right? So actually Mike Talkowski wrote a grant to develop a Nomad for long read data. That'll also help with these regions that are gonna come out of the pan genome project and be haplotype specific from different populations. But we're kind of waiting for the resources to help us because we're finding variants in these regions but having no idea what their frequency is because there's no reference database. We're all used to, oh, we just look it up in Nomad, right? It's not in Nomad. So these can be common variation. So we really, in order to really make best use of that, we're gonna need the resources and the allele frequencies, the population data, to all of those regions. So there's actually a consortium that PacBio has started to share PacBio data. And they're actually working with a company called DNA Stack to get all the groups to put their PacBio data in the same place so that we can start to build reference data sets out of these data as well. So it's, it's coming, but it's slowed by the lack of the sort of population reference data to get there. Let me ask one more and then I'll let Ben take it. I, you, Since you, you cooked me dinner last night, I'll, get, okay. I'll give you no, another one. Now you told everybody they're going to expect <laughs> me to cook them They're dinner. going to expect you to cook for them, no, too. I don't remember we talked about this last night. That's because the Italian wine was so good. But um, uh, um, you made the, the comment about the direct-to-consumer data. Yes. So I can't help but mention that this week a new company came out of stealth mode called Nucleus Genomics. Are you familiar with it? Uh, I have, so no, they're offering I'm three hundred ninety nine dollar whole genome sequences yep. direct to consumer, and I'm just curious in general what your view is on this growing availability of direct to consumer genomic data and how that's going to interface with the kind of things you're trying to do. Yeah, I have lots of opinions on direct to consumer, um, and they range from some areas where I feel it's good because there are patients out there that are at risk and they're not getting access in our healthcare system to basic data. And you know, even companies like 23andMe, where they've had BRCA1, at least the three Ashkenazi Jewish variants, in testing for a long time, there's been lots of patients who have gotten their risk where they would have fallen through our healthcare system, right? So I think there are some areas where I strongly believe and support the use of direct-to-consumer. But then you go to your Nebula Genomics report and these have been showing up in our physician's office with like 35 pages of every risk thing you can imagine, most of which is not valid. And the, que the patients and the physicians are like, what do I do with this? And I'm like, throw it in the trash, right? <laughs> so, so I think you know, there's, there's the hype and the engagement and taking advantage of people's interest in genetics to just make some money and put whatever whatever random new thing just got published that somebody made a GWAS claim on into a report. And so that I don't find very useful. So I think if we can focus on the things where there's actually something to do with these results and, and we can direct care based on them because they're valid, then I actually, you know, there's a lot of the, um, in addition to true direct consumer where there's no physician intermediary, there are a lot of the companies that are providing physicians, and it's essentially DTC, but at least they're targeted tests that are clinically useful, and they're helping get around our really poor healthcare system and the access issues. So I think there is a role for this in our ecosystem. We just need to kind of focus it in the right places, if that makes sense. Um, that was a great talk. I'm going to ask, a, I guess, a bad question, but just, I'm just curious about your prediction. Um, I think it's a bad question, but um, <laughs> so all these tools that you're building and these data that you're gathering and, and the things that you're doing to make these uh, the analyses easier and better and more accurate. Yeah. So in 10 years from now, or X number mm -hmm. of years from now, what do you think of uh, molecular geneticists or LGG trained geneticists or pathologists? Will these, the fanciest tests you can imagine, exome genome with all these other ohms, mm -hmm. is it going to become more like a CBC where you don't need much human intervention or does the runway keep moving? I'm just curious about what the human role is gonna be, if any. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, there's several different arenas that are gonna evolve, but I think the one place that is gonna be a long time coming is really trying to um, appreciate the complexity of phenotypes in a patient and how well they match to what's known about a given gene and the variants that cause disease in that gene and, and being able to judge, you know, this may be a pathogenic variant. I mean, this happens all the time. Like somebody finds a pathogenic variant and like I solved the case. Well, and I ask, 
actually, does that gene have any role in that patient's disease? And like, mm, maybe not. Um, so like that, that does require a fair bit of judgment. Now, where it's going to get, that part will also get easier over time, is if we can capture the phenotypes of every individual with rare disease and build a really valid database, then machine learning and semantic similarity, some of the HPO sort of algorithms that match things, you can actually get a semantic similarity score between your patient, their phenotypes, and the collective knowledge about a given gene that's associated with a given gene. So over time, we might have a scoring system that replaces our need to judge. Like, could this you know, patient's phenotype, do they actually have Marfan syndrome or not? And does this FPN1, you know, variant actually make sense? And today we're using a lot of clinical judgment in that process. And some lab geneticists have some of that knowledge. Some of them actually don't have good clinical training. And the physician really needs to play that sort of subsequent clinical, as Les and I like to talk about, you know, the different roles in this process. But but the so so I think that part is gonna evolve, but it's still going to require some, for a while some you know role in the in the geneticist and making some judgment there, as well as the fact that the evidence that supports pathogenicity is still you know as much as we are trying to make it as objective as possible, it is not always objective, and there's a lot of subjectivity deciding if that functional assay is actually valid and really documenting the role, you know, the disruption or not? Is it even a good question or system that's being tested? So there's judgment in looking at that evidence that you have at hand and saying, is that really good evidence or not so good to say that variant is even pathogenic, right? So I think those are the areas we will still have jobs <laughs> in our line of work. Can I, can yep. I follow up on that? Yep. AIP. How A is AIP? Um, so A is uh, the pipeline is fully automated, but the interpreting the results that come out of the pipeline is definitely not and has opportunity for improvement. Right now, it actually isn't using phenotype matching, and that's a part that we'll be building into it. So for sure, right now, like stuff comes out, and it's like, oh, that's a new pathogenic variant. It's nothing to do with my patient's phenotype. So, so that's where you know building that phenotype matching will, will be helpful. So I think we'll refine it over time in terms of the sensitivity and specificity, but it will always require some review at the end. And we're going to try and get the numbers of things you have to review down as low as possible. And you can also set it at different levels, right, in terms of you know only send an email to a physician if it's this high or versus our analysis team that does this stuff all the day, send it at a different level. So you can, you can titrate that a little bit. So um, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you didn't say much about pharmacogenetics, and, and I'm just curious as to how you're going about implementing that where you are. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. Like, long ago, we ran the crown trial for warfarin, and we had a test set up that had a turnaround time of five hours. So the moment a patient presented, um, we could get those results back immediately to influence the dosing of that drug in those patients. The physicians in our hospital were the ones leading that trial. We did all that work. And then the trial ended, and nobody ordered the test after that. I'm like, really? <laughs> and it, you know, it comes down to there's been years of uh, discussion and, and difference of opinion about the utility of warfarin pharmacogenomic testing. And is it clinically useful or not? Is it easier just to use empiric, you know, uh, sort of dosing? So I, I think there are certain pharmacogenomic um, areas that are clearly useful. Um, but a lot of them are a little unclear. And then, you know, when I first took on this chief genomics officer role, I was interviewing all the clinicians in the different clinics asking about what's working, what's not working, how are you using genetics? And I actually asked about pharmacogenomics in a number of them in places where they were ordering at least one marker. And uh, I said, well, you know, if you could just, for the same price, order a whole panel, which then would have markers that might be useful later, why not just do that? And the answer was, I do not want the liability of all those other markers from a test I ordered that then gets buried in the medical record, not accessible to any sort of support, and it's my back to like figure out what all those other markers do and is the patient on any other drugs and for the lifetime of that patient managing that data. So really at the end of the day, you have to have an EHR system 
that has clinical decision support, and we actually don't have that at Mass General Brigham today, unlike some of the you know, hospitals that are better leading in those areas. So I think eventually, absolutely, that will be important, but you have to have a healthcare system that can support it or it's not going to be utilized that effectively, is sort of so, where. So you mean putting it into the medical record in the background and only when the drug gets prescribed? Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's got to be point in time sort of guided. And, and the EPIC group is working with our, um, our genomic knowledge stream, work stream, and global alliance, and they're building that support to bring in uh, VCFs into the electronic health record. So because we can't rely on everybody building their own pharmacogenomics tool. Um, so I think once it really gets instantiated as a common feature in the HRs and we can bring uh, data into those uh, pipelines, then I think it'll take off much more regularly. 